Hello everyone, and welcome to the 126th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring the characters and themes of everything, everywhere, all at once. A whirlwind film of action, bizarro cinema, and beauty, this story provides us with some of the most human experiences that many of us can relate to, baked right into the center of its madness, and it triumphs in the message that it tries to convey. Though this film has a villain, the dreaded Jobu Tupaki, it's one that shows us intimately the evil that made its villain. So in this video, we're going to explore in detail all the nasty things that made Jobu Tupaki, and of course, the monster herself. And perhaps most importantly, the aforementioned message that's born from all the horrid things that we can find within. Now without further ado, let's begin. To begin to understand the evil present in this story is to become familiar with the most important aspects of this film that underpins everything that happens within it, all of which feed off one another, societal, cultural, and familial expectations. Joy is suffering under the weight of all these things in different ways, and what ties together these three very important aspects of her experiences is something known as transgenerational trauma. The validity and specifics of this concept are still debated on to this day, and we could go on for hours discussing it, but for the purposes of this video, we'll use the definition of this term that we can find on the website Medical Mondial. The term transgenerational trauma is used to refer to the generally subconscious transmission of traumatic experiences to subsequent generations and to society. People in the next generation, without having experienced the trauma themselves, traumatic experiences can affect individual, single people, or they can affect many people within a group. The term collective trauma is used in this case where trauma affects many people within a group. Examples of individual trauma can be violence within a family, life-threatening illnesses, accidents, and abuse in childhood. Examples of collective trauma include the Holocaust or the mass rape of women during the genocide in Rwanda. Now this website further assists us in understanding this concept by asking the following question. How does transgenerational trauma occur? The roots of transgenerational trauma initially lie in the traumatic experiences of one person or one group. These traumas are often not conscious, they are not recognized by society, and they are associated with feelings of guilt and shame, being treated as a taboo. The people affected do not receive appropriate support from their communities or societies. All of this can prevent this trauma being processed. Unprocessed trauma can then affect the way people form relationships with their own children. The impacts may influence manners of reacting, avoidance, behavior, or the ways of dealing with emotional intimacy and distance. In turn, they develop stress reactions, conflicts, and emotional pressures. Even if they are often not aware of this, these patterns are then nevertheless passed on in turn to their children. Now if you've seen the film, this should all sound quite familiar, but let's dive into this now and apply what we've learned here to Joy's primary source of transgenerational trauma, her mother Evelyn. Now Evelyn's source of transgenerational trauma comes from her father, and perhaps her mother too, and their infliction of trauma upon her stems from their identity as Chinese people. As we see during Evelyn's flashbacks, Evelyn was raised by a strict, disciplinarian father, and she was shunned by him when she chose to pursue a relationship with Waymond, despite his protestations. Gong Gong stating to her that if you abandon this family for that silly boy, then we will abandon you. You are not my daughter anymore. Now, though Evelyn's experiences with her father are a direct result of their roots in Chinese culture, the way that her father acts is not exclusive to just Chinese or East Asian people. I have experienced similar sentiments from my Arabic father, and whether you're black, white, Native American, Latino, Indian, or any other ethnicity, you may have felt the cruel hand of cultural, societal, or religious expectations that were imparted upon you by your parents or other close family members. And unfortunately, I'm sure many of you, including myself, who didn't meet those expectations, received similar treatment to Evelyn. Now Gong Gong likely found himself the subject of much the same treatment from his own parents, and it's through transgenerational trauma that this behavior was subconsciously passed on to him, and from him, on to Evelyn. As time goes on, and society evolves, these stigmas, biases, and expectations change quite a bit, and through the years, we can find the traumas of old dissipating as understanding and acceptance slowly render them obsolete. Slowly is the key word here. As though Evelyn doesn't quite abandon her daughter as Gong Gong did, she certainly displays a lessened form of what her father's biases might be. For example, Evelyn is quite blunt and matter-of-fact in the way that she speaks to her daughter, and everyone else for that matter. 
and she has difficulty displaying any type of emotion towards her outside of concern. Concern which is worded poorly, and only serves to hurt, rather than help. Like when she's concerned about her daughter's weight and health, as instead of telling her so in some sort of positive way, she tells her that she's getting fat, and that she needs to eat healthier. While that statement expresses how she feels, it doesn't do so in any kind of constructive way, an inherited way of approaching emotional situations with chastisement and concern that masks any sort of personal or emotional connection. This is a good example of something that she inherited from her father, and her behavior towards her daughter in this regard is important. However, the greatest example of this behavior from Evelyn is her handling of her daughter's sexuality and relationship with Becky. Now, Evelyn's distaste for her daughter's relationship and her fear of revealing that relationship to her father stems from the standard homophobia that can be found in many, many cultures across the world. And again, the attitude that she displays here in regard to Joy and Becky is not exclusive to just Chinese people. And the way she treats her daughter because of it is something that many people in the LGBTQIA community have had to suffer through. The first time we're given an example of this behavior, though it could be due to a language barrier, is when she refers to Becky as a him. But what calls into question the notion of a language barrier is the way she comments on how Joy and Becky dress, stating that she's sure many people confuse the two of them for men. She goes on to state to Joy that she's lucky that she has a mother who is open to her dating a girl, and a white girl at that. Which, while being a relatively positive statement, does imply that she might be one of those people but she has chosen to overlook the particulars of their relationship for her daughter's sake. Again, a positive, but it does call into question whether or not she has these biases. What seemingly confirms that she does is her telling Jobu Tupaki, upon first meeting her, that she is why her daughter is gay. And because Evelyn is blaming her daughter's sexuality on a negative entity, she's implying that her sexuality is a negative thing, which again, probably confirms the aforementioned biases. Now where her trauma comes into play is her refusal to introduce Becky to her father as Joy's girlfriend, having to suffer the horrendous feeling of being excommunicated by her father after she began a relationship with Waymond. Evelyn is ever fearful that her father will do the same to not just Joy, but likely herself once again if he learns that his granddaughter is not only gay, but dating a white woman. Therefore, even though Evelyn remembers the pain that she felt when her father exiled her, she's so ingrained in her inherited biases that she's unable to provide her daughter with the relief of an accepting parent that she craved when she was younger. Now something else that serves as a point of contention between Joy and Evelyn are the stark differences between American culture and Chinese culture. We're given a small example of this during Evelyn's flashbacks when we find an emo-styled teenage Joy telling her mother to shut up and that she'll talk to her mother however she wants. And this moment is followed by another several years later where Joy and her mother are awkwardly sitting in their van together, showing the obvious uncomfortable divide between the two. While some of what we see here can be chalked up to rebellious teenage angst, the problem is that this angst and rebellion is counterintuitive to what most traditional Chinese parents expect from their children. And just as Evelyn's father attempted to control her life, so too does Evelyn attempt to control her daughters. And it's this lack of control that serves as the focal point of Evelyn's animosity for her daughter, whether she knows it or not. Now, something that contributes to Evelyn's treatment of joy is her general pessimistic outlook on the world. And this is also something that she inherited from her father. From what little were given of Gong Gong, we can infer that he leans more towards being a strict disciplinarian, a no-nonsense taskmaster, and a xenophobe than he does towards being a kind, understanding, and accepting person. And Evelyn is much the same. We're shown this in the beginning of the film, when we see how agitated and irritable she is, when she's overwhelmed with work, and her attitude towards her husband's mistakes and playfulness with her or their customers is telling of how serious and uptight she constantly is. Her xenophobia shines through when she tells Joy that she thinks that Deirdre is targeting the Chinese community, and she goes on to support the statements I just made about her serious demeanor by telling Joy how ridiculous it was when Deirdre put a lean on their laundromat and Waymond brought her cookies. This shows us that Evelyn can't look past her biases to see that maybe Deirdre putting a lean on her laundromat or challenging her attempts to ride off a karaoke machine when you're in the laundry business isn't her targeting the Chinese community, but a part of her job. And just because Evelyn doesn't like that she's trying to undermine her doesn't mean that Deirdre is a nasty person person who deserves her ire. She's just doing her job, and in that same vein, she also can't fathom how her husband treating her like a human being, rather than a vicious governmental robot, helps rather than hurts. 
All of what we've discussed about Evelyn so far is further compounded by something central to her character, her own sense of despair that stems from her regretting her move to the U.S. and her marriage to Waymond. As we see multiple times throughout this story, Evelyn is both distraught by her current seemingly dismal situation and enamored by the glimpses she's given of what could have been in alternate universes. And when you factor these feelings into everything else we know about her, this all adds up to one pretty miserable person, one who is the primary source of the misery within her own daughter. Now, we know how this universe's Evelyn is harming her daughter's emotional and mental well-being, but it's Alpha Evelyn who destroys her daughter beyond recognition. An Evelyn who we can assume is much the same person that she is in this universe, but more brilliant. In her efforts to prove the existence of multiple universes, Alpha Evelyn discovered the trans-universal linking technology. One who was particularly skilled in this type of travel was her daughter Joy, and without any concern for her well-being, she pushed Joy beyond her limits until her mind was fractured into an infinite number of pieces, granting her the capability to experience every world and every possibility at the same exact time, giving her power beyond measure. In that capacity, Joy, now Jobu Tupaki, can do anything you can possibly imagine, even if it's absurd, like making a man explode into confetti, or smoking a gun like a bong. And as an all-encompassing multi-universal evil, it's impossible to measure the amount of crimes that Jobu Tupaki has committed, how many perhaps trillions of lives that she's ended. But why does Jobu do these things? Because she's given in to the lowest depths of nihilism, despair unending filling her soul from the realization that nothing she has ever done, or will ever do, in any conceivable universe, matters. And if that is the one objective truth of the universe, then of course she's lost any sense of morality and abandoned all other truths, as Wayman claims, as what do good and evil matter when nothing matters at all? If everything that has ever happened is happening or will ever happen is happening here or in any other number of other infinite amount of alternate universes, why does anything you do matter? If everything that's possible can be put onto a bagel, what's left for you? What's there to worry about when everything you do gets washed away in a sea of every other possibility, as Joy claims? All these questions and the absolute madness she experiences by being a fractured super being have led Jobu to one answer, that to end her pain, she needs to end her life. Now, though it's nihilism that has led her to this point, there's something that Joy, through her despair, cannot comprehend. I've touched on this idea in a couple other videos, and this film masterfully explains what beauty nihilism can bring. That beauty being that if nothing matters, then everything is possible, and everything can matter, and most importantly, that despair is never the correct solution to your problems. However, this is quite difficult to see when you're experiencing depression, and Jobu and Joy certainly are. When we first see Jobu and Evelyn as rocks, Jobu remarks that she's been trapped like that for so long, experiencing everything, and she was hoping that by finding someone just like her, that that person would be able to see something she couldn't, and convince her that there was another way, that ending it all wasn't the only remedy for her pain, a cry for help if there ever was one. Jobu Tupaki feels the pain of living a fractured life full of contradictions and confusion, a life where you're never fully present and frayed at both ends, one where only a few specks of time ever make any sense in the mad chaos that is existence. And though she's come to feel this pain due to her multi-universal existence, this pain is something that all of us may find ourselves unfortunate to feel in even a single lifetime in a single universe. And some of you watching this video may have been brought to that same brink or are currently staring into the black abyss of the bagel as I speak. In this particular story, Jobu and Joy are fortunately able to grasp the hand reaching for them as they dangle over the edge. Just as Jobu was craving to find someone who could feel the mind-fracturing pain that she feels, so too is Joy looking to have her mother feel her pain, to recognize her for who she is instead of fearing her and despising who she is. And the one possibility that Jobu could not fathom, even with all of her infinite experience and knowledge, was finally finding the acceptance and love of a mother who had brought her harm over the course of her life in every conceivable universe. As Evelyn and Joy learn, sometimes things are not as bad as you think they might be, and if they are, well, it's your life, and you can choose to live it how you want to live it, as nothing is certain, and everything is possible. But not every mistake is a mistake. Not every situation you find yourself in is one you can regret. Sure, it might have been better if you did something else, or it might have been worse, 
But though it's not possible all the time, if you can find the time to be present, to cherish what you have, who you are, and the ones you love, then you will inevitably find happiness, all the wonderful colors of the world at your fingertips, reflected back at you, in the eyes of your loved ones, even if those colors might come and go. And yes, you should always shoot for the stars, you should always try and make your dreams come true, and you should never let anyone get in the way of them if you can help it. You could be, or could have been, the you who becomes a celebrity after you got mugged in an alley and saved by a master martial artist. You could, or could have, written that next best-selling novel. Or, you could, or could have, etched your name in the history books by making new discoveries, or by solving the world's problems. Or, maybe you'll always be the you who works a mundane job and lives in an apartment with your significant other. And you know what? That's okay too. No matter who you are, what you've become, or what you think you're forced to be, there's always beauty to be found in your existence. And there's always the possibility of happiness and fulfillment around every corner. There can always be friends if you have the will to find them. There can always be family, whether genetic or made, that you can look to. And it's always possible that the people who have spurned you, who have let you down and thrown you out like yesterday's trash, can find it in themselves to fight like Waymond. And you should too, because if you do, if you look at the world with googly eyes and stretch out your hand to others with cookies in your palm, there will always be moments that wouldn't be possible if you weren't the you that is you where you are now. And the memories and experiences that you form here are a gift that only this version of yourself can open. Things don't always work out. And sometimes in a mean world, you need to be mean. And sometimes you can't always fight like Waymond. But using any sort of negativity as your first resort shouldn't be the answer unless you want to become unfulfilled or filled with despair. So rather than killing your loved ones or abandoning them or being fearful of their choices in their person or regretting the life you've made together, why not embrace them? Why not give them the love and the understanding that they deserve? Save the ones you love, whoever they are, for who they are and rejoice that you were given the honor to know them for who they are in the first place. Even if you don't absolutely adore every ounce of them because nobody is perfect, and that's okay too. And of course, you would do well to recognize that even the horrible lady doing your taxes is a person just like you, one who feels the same pain and joy that you do. And they could also use a bit of that same understanding. In the end, that's just how everyone in this film finds peace, how Jobu Tupaki becomes nothing but a bad memory and joy returns, metaphorically and physically. And at this end, what is there to say about all that we're presented with in this film? Well, I've said quite a lot already, and if there's anything more to be added to all we've discussed so far, it's one of the corniest tropes in existence, that being that love conquers all. Even though we've all heard that phrase across a number of different mediums throughout our history, the truth of that statement cannot be understated, for it is only with understanding and compassion that much of the world's hurts can be remedied. Not all of them, mind you, but the very personal ones that we can find occurring in this film certainly can. And I believe this story does a great job of proving that. Now, of course, you're all wondering at this point whether or not Jobu, or Joy, is an evil person. Well, that's up to you. What she did was certainly evil, as raging across multiple universes and destroying life with reckless abandon because of the blackness that you feel in your soul is not excusable. But ask yourself what you might do in a similar situation, where your soul drowned in depression and anger might lead your mind once you'd become an infinite god, experiencing everything, everywhere, all at once. Joy did not want to be Jobu Tupaki. She was made into Jobu Tupaki. And the monster manufactured by a multiversal mother does not necessarily need condemning in every conceivable universe. Some definitely. As depending on the scale of her crimes in each universe, which could include mass murder, she would rightfully be condemned and tried for the crime she committed. As nihilism and depression are not defenses that will hold up in any court of law or of heart. But the joy we first see yearning for acceptance from her family is but a vessel, and she, or any other version like her, can't be blamed for her darkest counterpart's misdeeds. Above all, my friends, I hope you, like Evelyn and Joy, can find peace and love in the chaos that is our existence. And though it's tempting sometimes, whatever evil that exists in your life that is bogging you down is never unending and can always be remedied.
Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on everything everywhere all at once? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, to my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community. And most importantly, if you, or anyone you know, is currently staring into the dark abyss that is the bagel, I'll leave some resources down in the description where you can find some great help. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.